In the name of the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. At the Woods House, we are in the midst of another birthday week. Hudson turned nine on Friday. We have already had two full days of Lego building and lightsaber dueling. There were a few moments in the previous week, though, when I wondered if Hudson would make it to see his ninth birthday. But thankfully, we got there. One of the things Hudson has gotten into lately, which I appreciate, is football. He started to be interested in watching some games and asking about the different teams, be they college or pro. And one of the questions he often asks is, which team do we belong to? Translation, which team are we supposed to cheer for? And I told him we could cheer for whoever we wanted to cheer for, as long as it isn't the team who's playing against A&M on Saturdays. I mean, it clearly says in the gospel, whoever is not against us is for us. Am I right? <laughs> but I digress. Though, I did spend some time thinking about that this week while working on this sermon. Not just the A&M game. I could actually forget about that one. But the teams we cheer for. And not just for sports teams, but for all sorts of things. We have our, our likes and our dislikes, often cheering on those people who champion the teams or things we align with or have an affinity for. It's sort of our way of determining who gets space in our life and who belongs and who doesn't. We're happy to cut out or cut off those things that feel like they don't or shouldn't belong based on our list of criteria for membership. We hear something similar in, excuse me, similar to this in today's gospel. When the disciples approach Jesus with a concern about an exorcist, a man who is healing in the name of Jesus, but isn't one of them, isn't following them, he is unfamiliar to them, not a part of their team. So they tried to stop him. And then Mark says that they go tell Jesus about this guy who's healing in his name. Uh, but none of them, but not one of them, and how they tried to stop him. And it's as if you can almost hear Jesus take a deep breath. And remind the disciples of what the purpose of all this is. What is the purpose? I'm glad you asked. One of the purposes of all of this, I think, Jesus is trying to convey here, is that we are called to live into a life of trust. Trust that God is present. Present doing the work God does in the midst of those, those things we like and those things we can agree on and also in those things we dislike or disagree about. We are trusting that God is present. Jesus reminds his disciples that though this man may not wear the same uniform as they wear, that he is doing the same work. The work we have been called to. The work of revealing how God is present in the ministry of healing and restoration. And then Jesus points out the danger of their concern about all of this. That they, in fact, are not trusting that God is present in this man's work. And that if they were to continue down this path, they would create a stumbling block for those who do. In fact, the phrase, to put a stumbling block, 
in front of someone comes from the verb we know as scandalize. Jesus was trying to show them that their behavior of exclusion, their derision of difference was scandalous and in and of itself divisive. The disciples' desire for how the exorcist ought to behave or should follow their particular way got in the way of their trust that God was already doing what God does in spite of their desires and expectations. Theologian Reinhold Niebuhr is quoted as saying, on the whole, People do not achieve great moral heights out of a sense of duty. You may be able to compel them to maintain certain minimum standards of, by stressing duty, but the highest moral and spiritual achievements depend not upon a push, but upon a pull. People must be charmed into righteousness, he says. The Reverend Daniel Heisman, who's the director of the National Association of Episcopal Schools, says that Niebuhr was writing out of a concern for what he saw in his fellow clergy and lay people. How we have a tendency to sink into a habit of cheap scolding, opting for criticism instead of aspiration. We live amidst a culture abundant with scolding. We look derisively on the beliefs and actions of others, ascribing to them little or no moral worth. He says that moral suasion is best done by the pull as opposed to the push. People must be charmed into righteousness. By charmed, he meant how the moral life we embody must be something compelling. Indeed, attractive and beguiling to others. Simply put, be salty, says Jesus. The same way salt preserves, the same way salt brings flavor, be that way in your life, in your faith, in your relationship with God and with each other. You see, Jesus is trying to be clear about what the consequences are of trying to push people into right behavior or way of being. It would be better to walk through life cutting off that arm or cutting out that eye than to never just see someone for the beautiful creation that they are. But here's the turn for Jesus. And this is what I think Niebuhr is referring to. What if we don't need to cut off anything? What if we, the body of Christ, chose to look like all of the created parts of this whole, operating in the different and diverse ways in which we were meant to function as if it were designed to be so? What if you and I took the saltiness which we are given, the spark of unique divine flavor each of us is given, and use it to preserve the spark of unique divine flavor in each other? Meaning that the you God created to be is enough. And I'm going to tell you it is enough. And I'm not going to tell you otherwise, because you are a beautifully loved creation, a holy, whole person who belongs. And if I were to say otherwise, maybe I'm the one who needs to take a step away. Stay salty, my friends. Preserve the goodness in each other. That is what being whole means. 
that we would lift up and celebrate this invitation to life together in loving community with one another for life's sake, for Christ's sake. Jesus is warning his disciples that when we begin to put qualifiers before the ways that we love, we heal or care for one another, we risk cutting ourselves off from being part of the holy whole body. Who belongs? Who is doing the work of God in the world? What does that look like? It looks like the one who welcomes another, such as you, or me, or any of us. Amen.